I invite you to have a seat and take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25 is going to be our text for today. If, uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 988 and you will find Matthew chapter 25. And as always, if you're here and you don't have a Bible, you want one, then please take that with you. That's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, God will change your life. So today we're continuing our series, Money Talks. And the uh, last couple of weeks, we've looked at Money Talks, does it say you're wise? And Money Talks, does it say that you trust God? And today we're, we're looking at Money Talks, does it say that you care? And uh, obviously, I'm sharing the message today with someone. This is Amber Smith, who is our director of Serve Ministries here at Calvary. And for those of you who don't know, Amber is my oldest daughter. And uh, there's always some people go, oh, now I can connect the dots. I get that. She's not here because she's my daughter. She's uh, here because uh, she, God's been calling her into ministry since she was 12 years old. She has a bachelor's degree in biblical studies and a master's degree in divinity from Southern Seminary. Uh, that's why she's uh, up in this place. And she has a heart for people and for this question about uh, do you care? So uh, does your money say that you care? Now, most of us want to be seen as compassionate, caring people, right? I mean, it, it, most people don't label themselves as an uncaring, cold-hearted jerk. You ever met someone who just say, yeah, I'm a cold and uncaring jerk? I mean, we all know those people, but they are not really aware that that's how they are. And, and, uh, and most of us, if we were to label ourselves, we would say, you know what? I care about people. I, I try to care. I try to be, you know, kind. And I try to be compassionate. And, and that's all well and good. But um, the question that really matters is, would Jesus agree with your assessment? His assessment is the only one that really carries any weight. Uh, Matthew chapter 25 is a text with three parables that Jesus told the last week that he was alive on this earth. And they're three parables of warning. He, he's trying to warn the people of God that, uh, by asking them some questions. And basically, the, the questions are, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure you're ready? Are you sure you're faithful? Are you sure that you care? And, and uh, our text is the third parable in this uh, chapter. I'd encourage you, though, to when you go home today or sometime this week, read Matthew 25 and just let the Word of God speak to you because it's such a powerful teaching from Jesus. So uh, let's look at Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. I'd encourage you to follow along. Uh, these are the words of Jesus, and he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
First thing I want you to know today is that Jesus has clear expectations for his followers. Jesus has clear expectations for his followers. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and by that I mean you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ with your life, then you know the expectations that he has for us. You know the expectations he has for you because he makes them very clear. Of course, it's easy to read this parable and maybe to get the wrong understanding of what Jesus is trying to say. So let me be really clear. We are not saved by doing good. We do good deeds because we love Jesus. I mean, you can read this and some people go, oh, so if I do these good things, if I feed the hungry, if I give thirsty uh, people water, if I take care of people, then I'm going to earn my way into heaven. And that is not what Jesus is saying. These parables, this parable is for people who are already in a relationship with God, that are identified as God's people. He's stating his expectations, not a method of how to get to heaven. Let me just be really clear. We get to heaven because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He suffered and died for our sins. Grace is a gift that God gives to us so that we can have eternal life. Because scripture is really clear, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. That the wages of our sin is death and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is not any of us that are going to qualify to be good enough to get to heaven. In fact, the Apostle Paul declares, it is by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. So uh, here, here's how I, I want you to think about this. Motives matter. Are you doing good stuff because you're hoping that you'll qualify for heaven? Or are you doing good deeds because Jesus Christ has changed your life and you love him and you are grateful for how he has saved you? Uh, because it's gratitude and not obligation. That's a huge distinction in our motives. So uh, if you're worried that you're not doing enough to get to heaven, you don't understand grace. And we would love to talk to you about that. On the other hand, if you think that grace means you can be lazy and selfish, then you don't understand Jesus. And that's a problem too, because if you're his child, you understand his heart. And if you don't understand his heart, then we need to have some more conversation about your relationship with Jesus. Because at Calvary, we exist to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. So Jesus has real clear expectations for his followers. We are not saved by doing good. Oh, you guys haven't put that up. We're not saved by doing good. We do good deeds because we love Jesus. And now we're ready for the next point, which is. Compassion is a characteristic of a Jesus follower. See, Jesus had compassion on us even when he didn't have to. Um, he could have let us all get what we deserve for our rebellion and our sin and let us go to hell. But thankfully he didn't. Instead, he came to earth and went to a horrific death on the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sin and have a relationship with God. And that is compassion. And all throughout scripture, we see how Jesus had compassion on people. And we can see that in Matthew 9, 36, when it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were helpless and harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And so if you are a follower of Christ and committed your life to following Jesus, then one characteristic trait that God wants to build in your life is for you to have compassion. And one thing we need to understand about compassion is that it, it requires us to move to action. So it's not just something that we feel or think about, but it will move us to action. And we can see this in scripture in 1 John 3, 17 and 18, where it says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not live in word or talk, but in deed and truth. So if you are a follower of Christ, these verses are showing us that if we truly love God and we truly love people, then it's going to move us to act in compassion toward others. So compassion is a characteristic of Jesus' followers, and God gives us more so that we can help those with less. God gives us more so we can help with those with less. Do you notice in the parable that Jesus doesn't differentiate between the rich people in the crowd and the poor people in the crowd? He just says, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. Now, most of the people listening to Jesus talk, were the, they were the working poor. 
the people of the land, who, who did not have a lot. In fact, when they prayed, they prayed, give us this day our daily bread, as Jesus taught us to pray. Now, we use those words, but there's not one of us in this room, I don't think, that really has to pray for daily bread. Because we've all got pantries stocked with food that we don't want to eat. Right? Are you like me? You can go to your pantry and open it up and look in there and go, yeah, I could eat that, but I don't want to. Truth is, I could probably live for two months out of my pantry, but I don't really don't want to eat that food for two solid months. But we've got, we've got pantries stocked with food. We've got freezers and refrigerators stocked with food that we can live out of. We just choose not to. They didn't have pantries. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have freezers. They needed God to provide their bread that day. And if they didn't work and earn some money, they weren't going to be able to feed their families. And yet Jesus didn't say, hey, if you happen to be one of the wealthy people in this crowd, then this applies to you. He was talking to all the people. If God has given you enough, then you have enough to share with people who have less. And, and notice that the excuses didn't matter to Jesus. Because all of us have excuses, right? We've all got our excuses that we kind of go to. Well, I don't have any time. I I'm too busy. I've got to do this. I've got to go here. I've got to save money for this project or this thing. Uh, we're taking a trip. We don't have the money. We, we all have excuses that we kind of lean into. And in the parable, did the excuses matter? Lord, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you stranger? When? When? Didn't matter. Did not matter at all to Jesus uh, of the excuses that they offered. God gives us more so that we can help those with less. And we have more living in the United States than most of the world. And I know this from experience. And so many times it's easy to miss how blessed we are. We get stuck in the daily routines of life and we never stop to see how blessed we are and to stay thankful how thankful we are to God. And I've had the privilege of traveling the world and seeing the world and seeing people live in poverty. And I know many people don't have that opportunity, which is why we brought the Compassion Experience here to Calvary. How many of you guys have already gone through the Compassion Experience? Here, here, here. Okay. How many of you guys are planning on going through? Okay. If you already haven't planned on going through, you can go right after this service and walk through um, there's three stories. You can go through one of them or all of them. They'll be open today until 5, and then they're open 9 to 5 tomorrow as well. So I really encourage you to go through because it's going to be so beneficial in seeing how blessed we are. And the reason for that is because you'll get to hear stories of real children and their life experience um, and get to hear the struggles that they deal with that we don't even think about here in the United States, like how to get clean drinking water or where our next meal is coming from or how to stay warm um, or how we have to hide out in the bush so we're not kidnapped as children. And, and so going through will just show us how blessed we are by, by where we live. And there may be some of you sitting here in the room who think, well, I don't have the, the means or the funds to be generous. I, I can't help sponsor a, a child. But for those of you who don't know, my husband Robert is the youth pastor here at Calvary, and I work part-time at Calvary. So we understand what it means not to have a lot of extra income. Wait, I, I thought churches were known for how well they paid. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we understand that. But ever since we've been married for the last seven years, We've made a commitment and made it a priority in our budget to sponsor at least one child because we want to be people of compassion. And this weekend, we're, we're going to sponsor another child um, from Honduras because we, we want that to be a priority in our life. And so, so some of us have more and some of us have less, but it's not about how much we have materialistically. It's about the attitude of our heart. So Jesus has clear expectations for his followers, and he has expectations for his church. Uh, so let's talk about Calvary's commitment, because as a church, we want to be obedient to Jesus. We want to fulfill his expectations as a congregation. So as a church, we feed the hungry, literally. If you're hungry today and you don't have a pantry stocked with food, you can go to the Connection Center after the service and just ask them for a gift card dismissed, and they'll give, that, give you that gift card. 
And you can go get some food. You can go get some groceries. You don't have enough to provide for Thanksgiving for your family? Get a gift card. We want to help you. We want to feed the hungry. And by the way, you don't have to explain your story. You don't have to justify it. You don't have to jump through some hoops. All you have to do is ask. And some of you know some people who could use a gift card. And uh, you're thinking, hey, can I get one for them? Yes, you can. Uh, you just have to kind of have to wait till you know, all the people who want them that are here get them. And then you can go and ask for one. And if we have some left over, you can take that. And you can be that angel of mercy that goes to somebody in need and says, hey, I want to represent Christ in Calvary to you. And I want to bless you with this. We want to feed the hungry. And after service today, you're going to have the opportunity um, to sponsor children through Compassion International. They'll be outside of the student wing and outside the front main entrance for you to stop by and look at that. And for those of you who are a little leery about um, sponsoring a child through an organization, Compassion International is the most trusted nonprofit organization for sponsoring children. They give the highest percentage of any um, organization directly to the children, so you know, can know that the money that you're giving is going to go to the children and bless them. It's $38 a month to sponsor a child, and with that money, you give the child um, food, clothing, um, education, medicine, health services, um, but most importantly, introducing them to Jesus. Yeah. And we feed the hungry uh, because whether you know this or not, Calvary is a Southern Baptist church. I know that kind of scares some of you, right? Because you're sitting here going, this is a Baptist church? <laughs> what are we doing here? Uh, it's okay. You don't have to tell anyone we're a Baptist church, but we are. Uh, but Southern Baptists have the third largest relief organization in the United States of America. We have over 75,000 trained volunteers who serve in disaster relief. And uh, so we feed the hungry. They roll up with their disaster relief trailers, open them up, start cooking meals and feeding people. And so they've been in Houston after the hurricane, in, in Florida after the hurricane. They're in Puerto Rico right now helping people who are hungry by feeding them. So we feed the hungry, literally, and we give water to the thirsty. We have Calvary has, have raised money for... 18 wells in Mozambique, which directly impacts 18,000 people to have clean and safe drinking water. And the really cool thing is that these wells are placed next to churches, so these people are also being introduced to Jesus as well. Yeah. By the way, you guys rock for giving the money for those wells. I just got to tell you that. That is awesome. Yeah. Hey, we cover other needs as, as well. We send medical teams to Thailand. Uh, we feed, clothe, educate. Uh, refugees in Athens. Uh, we're taking trips to both those places in the not-so-distant future, so if you're interested, uh, let us know. We'd love to take you along with those because uh, we want to meet all the needs. And, and next weekend, uh, we will have our Christmas bags out that we do every year for Peach Springs and Mexico. Um, but this year, I'm really excited. We are adding a third opportunity, and we're doing Christmas presents for foster care families in Lake Havasu City. So you have three different ways that you can get involved and be a blessing to people. And for the future, just so you guys know, uh, if you decide you want to sponsor or look at sponsoring a child of compassion and you go out to one of the tables, you're going to notice that most of the kids are from Honduras because Calvary is adopting Honduras as our compassion country. Uh, you know, Compassion has started taking people to meet their kids that they sponsor. So you can sponsor kids, you can meet them face to face. And so we're planning trips in the future where uh, we're going to go down as a, as a group to see the kids that we're sponsoring in Honduras. So we're partnering uh, with them as a country. Now, if you don't want to sponsor a child from Honduras, but you want to sponsor a child, there's other countries uh, available. But, uh, but we're doing that as a church. And my hope, my dream uh, is that one day we will actually partner with Compassion to plant a Compassion Church in Honduras. Uh, what they do is uh, for $75,000, they build a building, hire a pastor, and sponsor 300 kids uh, with the food, clothing, education, all that kind of stuff. But they do it through a church. Compassion does all their, ch their centers for kids through churches. And so uh, I want to, uh, to sponsor a church because then you're going to be impacting over 1,000 people's lives uh, as we touch those families with children who need that care. So uh, that's Calvary's commitment. Let's talk about your opportunity. Your opportunity, because this parable is a warning for the people of God. It's for us. And the rebuke in it is real. And this is your opportunity to identify and make decisions that impact your life and the lives of others. So first of all, understand we are blessed to be generous. Have you ever wondered uh, or thought about why God has blessed you the way that he has? Um, and the reason is it's not about us. 
God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing to other people. Psalms 112.5 says, It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. And so God has blessed us so that we can bless other people. And so are you living your life like you are blessed by God? And so for those of you who are struggling to see how blessed you are, um, we're going to compare the U.S. around the world and just see what it's like if you were to be in another part of the world. Because we do live in one of the best countries in the world with the most resources and opportunities. And so we're going to look at Honduras since our church is sponsoring Honduras through Compassion. Um, so if you were to live in Honduras, you would make about 90% less money than you do in the United States. The average income in the U.S. is $52,000. The average income in Honduras is $4,800 a year. So a huge difference. Um, if you lived in Honduras, you would use 95% electricity than less. you do. Yeah, less electricity. Um, the reason for that is because people just don't have access to electricity. Or if they do, they only have it in a small window during the day to use that electricity. I don't want to freak you out, but that means you wouldn't have internet. <laughs> okay, yeah. See how, see how, how no difficult phones. it is? Yeah. Um, this is a statistic from Forbes, um, and these um, links are in your bulletin if you want to go and read the articles and learn more about this information. Um, so it says the bottom 10% of Americans, so low-income poor, live better than the top 10%, so the wealthiest, of Italy, Israel, Russia, Portugal, Brazil, Turkey, Mexico, and many, many other countries. So we living in America, no matter what economic status you're in, live better than the wealthiest people around the world. And then this is a quote from the Pew Research Center. It says, many Americans classified as poor by the US government would be middle income globally. So we have so much simply by where we were born and where we live. And so let's recognize the blessings that God has given us and decide to be generous. Mm. Hey, we got, a, we got a holiday coming up Thursday. You guys know what it is? Yeah, Thanksgiving. And, and we have a holiday set apart to give thanks to God, at least originally, uh, for how he's blessed us. And, and I know just from living in this world that there's a lot of us who struggle to really embrace this idea of thanksgiving and gratitude on a daily basis. And, and we've turned a, a holiday set apart for Thanksgiving to a holiday set apart for overeating and football and getting ready for Black Friday, which now begins on Thanksgiving in one of the mysteries of, of world, the world we live in. But, but I want you to think about this. Uh, how many of you chose to be born in America? No, you see, you didn't choose where you were born. And in reality, and, and I stole this quote from a, a professor, we've won the lottery of history. Because we live in the United States of America, two, 20, 2017, and, and we have more than most of the world's ever dreamed of having in terms of resources, opportunities, and freedom. We've won the lottery of history. Every one of you is a lottery winner. And if you don't see that, then sometimes it gets in the way of us being thankful for the things that we have. And, and so I want you to, to just kind of let that marinate in your soul and, and grow in gratitude and understand that God has blessed you in order to be generous. And if you want to bless your children or your grandchildren, teach them to care. Teach them to care. It, do you know that a lot of times that we actually justify our selfishness because we want to bless our kids? Or our grandkids, we're like, oh, but I want my kids to experience this. I want them to have this. I want them to go here. I, I want to do all these things. I want to bless my kids. And so I can't be generous because I'm, I'm saving it up for them. And yet we want our children to become, you know, caring, generous followers of Jesus Christ. And they're not going to learn that by what we say. They're going to learn that by what we do. And so teach your kids to to be those generous, caring people. And so in, just for my life, honestly, uh, I, more than wanting my children to have the perfect childhood experiences, I wanted them to have the heart of Jesus. 
And I am really thankful that you did teach us that and that you gave me the opportunity when I was 12 years old um, to go on a mission trip to Nigeria. And that trip completely changed my life. Um, it taught me truly how to have compassion for people. And I would not be who I am today without going and experiencing what I did. And one of the things that we did while we were there is we went to orphanages. And the first orphanage we went to were run by Christians and they cared for the children and they loved them. So, so leaving there, you had a feeling of hope because you know these people cared for the kids because they loved God. The second orphanage was nothing like that. It was run by the government, um, and these people didn't care at all about the children. Um, what we did was we took food and we took toys to the orphanage for the children. Um, and the people that took us said most of the food probably wouldn't reach the children because the people who ran it would either take it home for themselves or sell it to make money, um, which breaks my heart. But that's not um, what made me the most upset is as a 12-year-old girl, I had taken all these toys that the church collected so we could go and, and set them up and the kids could come and pick out a toy and we could play together and talk and have fun. And that didn't happen at all. The people who ran the orphanage marched the children in like they were prisoners, didn't let them talk or anything, and just threw toys at them and, and shuffled them out. And it enraged me so much because these people didn't care at all about these children and had no compassion for them whatsoever. Um, and that, that experience showed me what injustice is in the world, and it taught me that I want to be a person of compassion and I want to care about people, especially children. I want every child to have a healthy, thriving life and to have an opportunity to, to meet Jesus, which is why I am such a huge supporter of Compassion International, because that's what they do. And you have an opportunity to be a part of that and to change a child's life um, today after the service um, and to make an eternal difference in a child's life. So. Um, I, I would hope that everyone would want to sponsor a child and make that impact. Mm. Yeah, on a personal note, uh, Merald and I are also huge fans of Compassion. We've been sponsoring Children of Compassion since our girls were little. Uh, and, and we wanted them to know that other children in this world matter to God just as much as they do. And uh, so we're actually on our second generation of Compassion Kids. And, uh, and since now we're grandparents... We're going to sponsor uh, two more children, uh, one for each grandchild, uh, this weekend. And so uh, when we go to Honduras, and I can see my kids down there uh, along with you. But uh, it's just something that if you got uh, kids or grandkids, you may want to think about. Of course, you know, your kids might be more prolific in, than my kids. And I don't know if I'll be able to keep this up and afford it. But, uh, uh, but I, I do want more grandkids, so I'm willing to take that risk. So, uh, but it's... It's one of those things that uh, we decided to do because, again, I wanted my kids to know that other children matter to God just as much as they do. Another person besides my parents who taught me to be generous and to care about people um, is my Nana. And she is one of the most generous people that I know, and she taught me so much about um, caring for people and serving them. And what she did was, when I was seven years old, she decided to change Christmas up a little bit. And she had a budget of $100 for each of her grandchildren. Um, and what she decided to do is to have us take $50 of our Christmas budget and give it to Samaritan's Purse. And what they did is, at Christmas time, they have a catalog where you can pick different things to send around the world, things like medicine and goats and chickens and blankets and food for children and all sorts of things. And so it was so exciting for us to get the catalog and go through and, and pick out the things that we were going to give to people. And um, my sister and I soon decided that we wanted to give all $100 of our Christmas money to Samaritan's Purse because we loved it so much. Um, and it was one of the most important things as a child for me to teach me to be generous and to care about other people and to see how blessed I am. And honestly, it's the best Christmas memories that I have because I don't remember many of the toys and gifts that I got growing up, but I have these wonderful memories of giving to Samaritan's Purse. And it's something that we still do as a family today. So if you're a grandparent, I would highly encourage you to think about doing something like this. Um, Samaritan's Purse still 
still does this, um, and Compassion International also has gift catalogs, um, and you can pick those up on the tables as your way out if you want to do something like this. And, and not only that, but it'll be the only Christmas gifts you give that are tax deductible. <laughs> Just a win-win if you, uh, I'm saying, uh, if you're thinking about that. Hey, remember, if you want to bless your children, teach them to care. Uh, money talks. Does yours say that you care? More importantly, does Jesus say that you care? Because now you know what he expects his children to do. And, and I just want to close with this thought. This message is not about sponsoring children of compassion. Uh, I, I, obviously, I believe in sponsoring children of compassion, and I would love it if every family in this church said, hey, we want to sponsor uh, a, a child of compassion. But the point of this message is not to get you to do that. The point of this message is this. One day, every one of us in this room will stand before Jesus and give an account of our life. And when he does, when you have to stand before him and, and he speaks to you, I want you to be in the group on the right. I want you to hear, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. If that day was today, is that what you'd hear based on your life? If the answer is no, then you have an opportunity to change course. It's called repentance and surrender to Jesus. We sang about it earlier. If the answer is yes, then I want to encourage you to stay on that course and to grow in your faith and in your generosity. Because God has called us, he has saved us by grace, and he expects us to be people who care. Let's pray.